assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to the class of comedy of manners as you are already uh, reading when I mean, the play pigmalion by jb shaw uh, with me you are going to do act 5 of pigmalion and uh, what would be the strategy the strategy would be that we'll be reading the entire um, act 5 and we'll be discussing it uh, side by side uh and uh, i have divided my entire discussion and the reading of this act into two lectures uh first lecture will be dealing with the the first half of uh, act 5 and the second lecture would be dealing with the second half of act 5 plus uh, there is a conclusion of uh, uh, act 5 of pigmalion uh since uh, you are already familiar with all the major characters situations conflicts in the play so we'll move straight to the uh, uh, to the reading of act 5 and um, uh, uh, as all the major characters are uh, being introduced already uh, we are moving towards uh, the conclusion or what we call the resolution and we also need to see whether there is a resolution in this act or not Okay, this is Pygmalion by J.B. Shaw, Act Five, and uh, the setting is Mrs. Higgins' drawing room. She is at her writing table as before. The parlor maid comes in. The parlor maid at the door. Mr. Henry, ma'am, is downstairs with Colonel Pickering. Well, show them up. They are using the telephone, ma'am. Telephoning the to the police, I think. What? the parlor maid coming further in and lowering her voice mr henry is in a state ma'am i thought i'd better tell you if you had told me that mr henry was not in a state it would have been more surprising tell them to come up when they have finished with the police i suppose he has lost he has lost something so uh, the mention of police here uh, naturally um uh, produces uh, the element of suspense that what the entire matter regarding police is about but if you keep act uh, the ending of act 4 in your mind uh, you'll uh, you'll be thinking of the uh, row and the conflict between Higgins and Eliza that she has uh, probably disappeared suddenly and when uh, the parlor maid announces or informs mrs higgins mother of professor higgins that he is in a state she means to uh, say that mr henry uh, is very angry and when mrs higgins says uh, if you had told me that mr henry was not in a state it would have been more surprising means henry higgins is quite uh, predictable to Uh, his mother uh, she knows him very well okay she says tell them to come up when they have finished with the police i suppose he has lost something uh, but here she is not able to guess what actually uh, henry uh, is about or why he has actually uh, he is trying to contact the police the parlor maid yes ma'am then she goes this is against go upstairs and um go upstairs and tell miss julie that mr henry and colonel colonel are here ask her not to come down till i send for her so uh this is important uh, in the sense that uh, this statement of uh, uh mrs higgins uh, where she guides parlor maid that um, uh, mr dolittle that is eliza dolittle uh, that she should stay upstairs until uh, unless she is being asked to come downstairs uh, this uh, statement uh, later on we'll see that uh, it will create dramatic irony in act 5 dramatic irony as you know is a technique used by playwrights and um, uh, what purpose does it serve and what does actually dramatic irony mean uh, dramatic irony is when uh, a few characters on stage know something and um, 
uh, but the main character is completely unaware of that fact so we'll be uh, observing later on that uh, uh, we we being audience and we being a reader are informed that uh, uh, eliza doolittle is at uh, mrs higgins home uh, but this fact is to uh, is uh, but this thing is not to be informed um, uh, uh, henry higgins uh, this thing is not to be disclo disclosed to henry higgins and it will ultimately create dramatic irony the parlor maid yes ma'am higgins bursts in he is as the parlor maid said in a state so um, when we talk about gb show uh, the stage directions are always important and uh, he appears not only as a playwright um, in his um, in his drama he actually uh, is the one who has uh, command over his stagecraft and uh, we we feel like uh, uh, it's not simply um, a playwright uh, guiding producer or the director what and how it should uh, be enacted on the stage rather we think and we uh, feel that it is a narrator who uh, has his own perspective so um, uh, shaw very um, uh, prominently uh, uh, makes himself appear in these stage directions when he says higgins bursts in he is as the parliament has said in a state so he is angry higgins look here mother here is a confounded thing, Confound, confounded thing, uh, most annoying thing. Mrs. Higgins, yes, dear. Good morning. Uh, we see that she is the first one to greet, uh, and Higgins uh, does not greet her. So we find Mrs. Higgins that uh, she uh, uh, she is the one. She's a perfect example of uh, Victorian morality. Uh, she is a sophisticated lady. He checks his impatience and kisses her. Checks his impatience means he tries to control his impatience and he kisses her. Whilst the polymer goes out, what is it? Higgins, Eliza's bolted. Eliza's bolted? Eliza has run out, run away. Uh, Mrs. Higgins, calmly continuing her writing. Calmly uh, you'll be noticing the, the 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 stage directions or the directions for the characters. They actually uh, the purpose of these uh, such directions uh, is to uh, show the mood of a particular writer. So she is uh, saying she is going to say, uh, "You must have frightened her in a very uh, calm post, uh, uh, calm mood." simply because she is uh, already aware of the fact where Eliza actually is. She knows that Eliza is upstairs. Higgins frightened her? Nonsense. She was left last night as usual to turn out the lights and all that. And instead of going to bed, she changed her clothes and went right off. Her bed wasn't slept in. She came in a cab for her things before seven this morning. And that fool Mrs. Pierce let her have them without telling me a word about it. What am I to do? So uh, we see that in Act Two, uh, he is quite. He seems like uh, he uh, respects Mrs. Pierce like his mother, uh, but here he is uh, calling her a fool. So when Higgins is in a state, or when Higgins is in his uh, bad temper, he can go to any extent uh, in calling abusive words. Uh, so we. Up till now, uh, since we have been through Act 1, 2, 3, and 4, we see that uh, he is accustomed to such foul language. Mrs. Higgins. Um, okay. What am I to do? Mrs. Higgins uh, replies, do without. Do without? Do without Eliza. I'm afraid, Henry. The girl has a perfect right to leave if she chooses. Higgins, wandering distractedly across the room. But I can't find anything. I don't know what appointments I have got. Um, Pickering comes in. Mrs. Higgins put down her pen and turns away from the writing table. Pickering, shaking hands. Good morning, Mrs. Higgins. Has Henry told you? He sits down on the ottoman. Higgins, what does that ass of an inspector say? Have you offered a reward? 
now we see that Higgins uh, is getting more abusive in his uh, use of language and uh, it will culminate later on uh, by the uh, middle of this act when Higgins will be talking to Eliza. Uh, Mrs. Higgins rising in indignant amazement. You don't mean to say you have set police after Eliza? Higgins. Of course. What are the police for? What else could we do? He sits in Elizabethan chair. So, uh, Ottoman and Elizabethan chair, uh, the, the kind of ref, uh, furniture that is being used at Mrs. Higgins' home, and we see that it is quite, um, uh, uh, it, is, it is a house of a lady who uh, belongs to upper class. She is well off. Pickering. The inspector made a lot of difficulties. I really think he suspected us of some improper purpose, Mrs. Higgins. Well, of course he did. What right have you to go to the police and give the girl's name as if she were a thief or a lost umbrella or something? Really? She sits down again, deeply vexed. Deeply vexed, she can't really um, uh, understand and believe that Henry has actually set police. After Eliza Higgins. But we want to find her, Pickering. We can't let her go like this, you know, Mrs. Higgins. What were we to do? Mrs. Higgins. You have no more sense, either of you, than two children. Why? Uh, two children, it is um, uh, the same uh, word that Mrs. Higgins uses for Higgins and uh, uh, Pickering in Act 3. So we'll see that they are actually a pair of two babies. Uh, the parlor maid comes in and breaks off the conversation. Mr. Henry, a gentleman wants to see you very particular. He's been sent on from Wimpole Street. Higgins, oh brother, oh, sorry, oh bother. I can't see anyone now. Who is it? The parlor maid, a uh, Mr. Doolittle, sir. Pickering. Doolittle? Do you mean the dustman? Dustman? Oh, no, sir. A gentleman. Higgins surprising, uh, springing up excitedly. By George. Pick, it's some relative of hers that she has gone to. Somebody we know nothing about. To the parlor maid. Send him up. Quick. The parlor maid. Yes, sir. She goes. The parlor maid. Okay, Higgins eagerly going to his mother. Genteel relatives. Genteel relatives? Uh, genteel means uh, well-behaved, cultured relatives having good status. Uh, okay, Higgins says genteel relatives. Now we shall hear something. He sits down in Chippendale chair. Uh, sorry, Chippendale chair. Uh, again, uh, a reference to the kind of furniture that is there at Mrs. Higgins' home. Okay. Mrs. Higgins, do you know any of her people? Pickering, only her father, the fellow we told you about. The father made announcing. Mr. Doolittle, she withdraws. Now, uh, read these stage directions very carefully. It states, Doolittle enters. He is brilliantly dressed in a new fashionable frock coat with white waistcoat and grey trousers. A flower in his buttonhole, a dazzling silk, dazzling is bright, and a patent leather shoes uh, complete the effect. Uh, patent leather shoes um, refers to bright black leather. He is too concerned with the business he has come on to notice Mrs. Higgins. He walks straight to Higgins and accosts him, accosts him, addresses him with women reproach. Doolittle indicating his own person. See here, do you see this? You done this. Higgins, done what, man? Doolittle. You done this? Um, uh, since he is indicating uh, this to himself, uh, we see that uh, Doolittle is always a source of fun. He accuses, um, uh, the, the moment he enters, he accuses Higgins of something. But the reader or the audience 
uh, they do not know what he is actually uh, accusing Higgins of. Um, and uh, uh, one very important thing uh, to notice here is the entrance of uh, the second entrance of uh, Alfred Doolittle when he appears in in second um, act. We notice that Mrs. Pierce is quite reluctant to let uh, Alfred Doolittle enter the house uh, simply because of his uh, poor appearance. Uh, but now, uh, since he is in a more uh, proper dress and he is um, as Shaw says, brilliantly dressed, uh, the polemic takes him to uh, to be a gentleman, not a dustman, obviously. Uh, so uh, the motif of dress that is uh, being introduced right in the beginning of the play uh, continues uh, till the very end. And uh, uh, it is through dress and it is through apparel, the physiognomy, the physical appearance of the character uh, that one's so, uh, socioeconomic um, status is being judged. Okay, Doolittle accuses. See here, do you see this? You done this, Higgins. Done what, man? Doolittle. This, I tell you, look at it. Look at this hat. Look at this coat. Pickering. Has Eliza been buying you clothes? Doolittle. Eliza? Not she, not half. Why would she buy me clothes? Mrs. Higgins. Good morning, Mr. Doolittle. Won't you sit down? So we see that uh, Mrs. Higgins, uh, again, is a woman who is courteous and she is well-mannered. And uh, um, it is also interesting that uh, Doolittle, though he has become rich and he appears to be rich as he has just taken an uh, entry uh, on the stage, we see that uh, uh, he directly come and he uh, starts uh, accusing Higgins without greeting anyone but uh, mrs higgins is the one who never forgets uh, to uh, to be courteous and to be polite and this also shows the manners that we are talking about it also shows that uh, uh, the the difference between their classes though uh, doolittle has um, appears to be a rich man now but uh, he cannot inherit um those manners, those qualities, which are uh, particular to a, uh, a certain class. Doolittle. Okay, Doolittle taken aback as he becomes conscious that he has forgotten his hostess. Um, taken aback, he is surprised, he is startled or sort of embarrassed. Um, asking your pardon, ma'am. He uh, approaches her and shakes her preferred uh, hand. Thank you. He sits down on the ottoman uh, on Pickering's right. Now, sitting on Pickering's right is also important because he has raised in his social status. So uh, uh, he does not uh, wait anymore that somebody else should uh, ask, um, ask him to sit down. He quickly finds a seat and he makes himself comfortable there. Um, and we see that it's a profound change in the body of language. This is what we call uh, money matters. I am I am that full of what has happened to me that I can't think of anything else. And since um, um, up till now we are uh, observing Alfred Doolittle, what he really wants to see, uh, we, are, we haven't uh, reached the point what actually bothering Doolittle and from where he has got that money that he seems to be a perfect gentleman. Higgins, what the dickens has happened to you? What the dickens? What the devil has happened to you, Doolittle? I shouldn't mind if it had only happened to me. Anything might happen to anybody and nobody to blame but Providence. Providence um, is uh, uh, Pro Providence with capital P. So uh, stands for God or uh, in other words, uh, to for fate, as you might say. But this is something that you done to me. Yes, you and Higgins. Higgins, have you found Eliza? That's the point. So we see that Higgins is um, still on the point uh, where Eliza is. And Doolittle is also on his point uh, that uh, he is blaming Higgins for something. And this is actually increasing um, uh, the element of suspense 
in the uh, in the play in the scene both are not listening to each other and both are uh, stuck on their own points okay when he says when he can says have you found eliza that's the point do little says have you lost her and uh, this is again a humorous comment have you lost her um, also uh, refers um, we can say that this is the technique of reparty uh, reparty re is the quick intelligent reply so when he says have you um, have you found eliza do little abrupt and witty responses have you lost her and this is also humorous higgins yes do little you have all the luck you have you have all the luck uh, this is also humorous uh, but it also gives an insight into the character of Alfred Doolittle being father. I ain't found her, but she'll find me quick enough now after what you've done to me. Mrs. Higgins finally raises this question. But what has my son done to you, Mr. Doolittle? Doolittle. Done to me? Ruined me. Destroyed my happiness. Tied me up and delivered me into the hands of middle class morality. And now we have come uh, to some un understanding of what is actually bothering Alfred Little. Uh, tied me up and delivered me into the hands of middle class morality. And from now onward, um, this topic, middle class morality, is going to be the, uh, the subject of discussion uh, between Doolittle and the rest of the characters present on the stage. Higgins, rising intolerantly and standing over Doolittle. You are raving. You are raving. You are uh, talking nonsense. You are drunk. You are mad. I gave you five pounds. After that, I had two conversations with you at half a crown an hour. I have never seen you since. Do little. Oh, drunk. Am I mad? Am I? Tell me this. Did you or did you not write a letter to an old blither in America that was giving five millions to found moral reform societies all over the world and that wanted you to invent a universal language for him okay uh, uh blither is a slang for a cursed uh, or a damned fellow so uh, did you or did you not write a letter to an old writer uh, uh, this is a reference to a particular person uh, who wanted uh, 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 higgins to invent universal language for him uh, okay, Higgins, what? Ezra D. want a fellow? He's dead. He sits down again carelessly. And we see that uh, uh, he sits down again carelessly uh, while Doolittle is so much worried about uh, something, but Higgins, he seems to be carelessly. And this is typical Higgins. Doolittle. Yes, he's dead, and I am done for. Now, did you or did you not write a letter to him to say that the most original moralist at present in England, to the best of your knowledge, was Alfred Doolittle, a common dustman? And this is uh, what we, uh, uh, if we uh, try to um, uh, look at uh, his uh, accusation, we uh, we can think of Act Two, where Higgins was impressed by. Uh, by Doolittle's rhetoric. Higgins, oh, after your last visit, I remember making some silly joke of the kind. Uh, some silly jokes, uh, joke of the kind, again, it's typical Higgins. Joke proved to be a practical joke for um, uh, Alfred Doolittle. Doolittle. Oh, you may well call it a silly joke. It put the lid on on me right enough. Uh, it put the lid on me right enough. Just give him the chance. He wanted to show that Americans uh, is not like us, that they recognize and respect merit in every class of life. However, humble, them words is in his blooming will, blooming bloody will, in which Henry Higgins, thanks to your silly joking, he leaves me a share in his free. A digested cheese tr uh, trust worth 3000 a year on condition that I lecture for his Bonifala Moral Reform World League as often as they ask me up, up to six times a year. The devil he does. Phew. 
view is uh, sort of um, it's an element of surprise brightening suddenly what a lock what a lock what a fun pickering a safe thing for you do little they won't ask you twice pickering just makes this comment about do little simply because he thinks that uh, do little uh, cannot uh, deliver lecture so he 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 says to do little that he does not need to be uh, worried because they won't ask you twice you will be so pathetic while giving your first lecture do little it and the lecturing i mind i lecture them blue in the face i will and not turn a hair okay um i lecture them blue in the face blue in the face means i lecture them till they are exhausted and here uh, the interesting thing is it end uh, lecturing i i mind lecturing uh, he says this and this is humorous in a way because uh, um, it end lecturing means that uh, he uh, he speaks like he is he's been used to giving lectures um, he, he he pretends or he seems to uh, show that he he is an expert in giving lectures it end the lecturing i mind i lecture them blue in the face blue in the face i lecture them until they are exhausted uh, until they are exhausted i will and not turn a hair i uh, not turn a hair that i will not show them any signs of fatigue it's making gentlemen of me that i object to so this is something uh, humorous this is something interesting uh, his ob uh, his ob uh, objection is not that they are they will be asking him for um, a lecture uh, rather he is more annoyed because they have made him a common dustman a gentleman who asked him to make a gentleman of me i was happy i was free i touched pretty nigh everybody for money when i wanted um i touched means that he went to and demanded money uh, pretty nigh everybody uh, almost to uh, almost from everyone okay i was free i touched pretty nigh everybody for money when i wanted it same as i touched you henry higgins now i am worried tied neck and heels and everybody touches me for money um why uh, for money because he has become a rich man it's a fine thing for you says my solicitor solicitor is um, legal advisor is it says i you mean it's a good thing for you i says when i was a poor man and I, and had a solicitor once solicitor um, legal advisor i told you and had a solicitor once when they found a pram in the dust cart he got me off and got sh uh, shut off me got me off means uh, he refused uh, the solicitor the legal advisor he refused to take up my case and got shut off me and got me uh, uh, and got me shut off him as quick as he could same with the doctors uh, used to shove me shove me um, uh, they used to push me out of the hospital before i could hardly stand on my legs and nothing to pay uh, why the lawyers the legal advisors and the um, doctors used to treat him like this simply because he was a poor man then and he had no money now they finds uh, finds out that i am not a healthy not a healthy man i and can't live unless they looks after me twice a day and the same doctors now they behave like uh, he they are very much concerned about the health of uh, this man as per do little simply because he has uh, come into possession of a good amount of money in the house i'm not i'm uh, i'm not let do a hand's turn for myself somebody else must do it and touch for me uh, touch me for it a year ago i had an relative in world except two or three that wouldn't speak to me now i have 50 and not a decent week's wages among the lot of them i have to live for others and not for myself and this is uh, what alfred dolittle has already defined being middle class morality that you have to live for others not for uh your uh, not for yourself and uh, here through character of alfred dolittle uh, shaw is actually bringing in the discussion about um uh, class differences uh, okay he says i have to live for others and not for myself that's middle class morality you talk you talk of losing eliza 
Don't you be anxious. I bet she's on my doorstep by this. She that could support herself easy by selling flowers if it if I wasn't respectable, and the next one to touch, uh, touch me will be you, Henry Higgins. And this is something interesting that he, um, uh, Alfred Doolittle has become rich uh, just because of Higgins. And he uh, here is accusing Higgins uh, that he will be the next one to uh, contact Alfred Doolittle for money. I'll have to learn to speak middle class language from you. Uh, language, again, is an important element um, if you rise uh, in your social status. And begins, I'll have to learn to speak middle class language from you instead of speaking proper English. That's where you'll come in. And I dare say that's what you've done it for, Mrs. Higgins. But my dear Mr. Doolittle, you need not suffer all this if you are really in earnest. Nobody can force you to accept this bequest, this bequest, this um, legacy. You can repudiate it, repudiate it. You can reject it. Isn't that so, Colonel Pickering? Pickering, I believe so, Doolittle, softening his manner in deference to her sex. That's the tragedy of it, ma'am. It's easy to say chuck it. It's easy to say chuck it. Chuck it means um, to throw it. But I haven't the nerve uh, which one of us has. We are all intimidated. Intimidated, we are all being scared, rendered nervous, or demoralized. Intimidated, ma'am. That's what we are. What is there for me if I chuck it but the workhouse in my old age? I have to dye my hair already to keep my job as a dustman. Why he he needs to dye his hair? Because uh, uh, he, uh, in order to look uh, younger, because if he uh, appears to be an old man, they will throw him out. If he will not um, get the job. If I was one of the deserving poor and had put by a bit, I could chuck it. I could chuck it. I could throw it. But then why should I? A cause, the deserving poor, a cause, a cause. Uh, the deserving poor might as well be millionaires for all the happiness they ever has. They don't know what happiness is. But I, as one of the undeserving, undeserving poor, have nothing between me and the pauper's uniform. But this here blustered 3,000 a year that shoves me into the middle class. Excuse the expression, ma'am. You'd use it yourself if you had my provocation. Okay. They have got you every way you turn. It's a choice between the skilly of the workhouse and the um, cabbages um, of the middle class. Okay, what is this um, reference to skilly? Um, skilly of the workhouse and the cabbages. Uh, the, actually, the correct phrase is between Scylla. Uh, 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 Scylla and uh, Cabidus both are the names of two dangerous uh, rivers mentioned by Homer in his uh, the in his uh, the Odyssey. Um, but obviously, Alfred do a little not knowing it pronounces it uh, wrongly. Okay, uh, of the middle class, and I haven't the nerve uh, for the workhouse. Intimidated. That's what I'm broke, bought up. Happier men than me will call for my dust and touch me for their tip. And I look on helpless and envy them. And that's what your son has brought me to. He is overcome by his emotion. Mrs. Higgins. Well, I'm very glad you are not going to do anything foolish, Mr. Doolittle. For this solves the problem of Eliza's future. You, you can provide for her now, Doolittle, with melancholy resignation. Yes, ma'am. I am expected to provide for everyone now, out of 3,000 a year. Higgins jumping up. Nonsense. He can't provide for her. He shan't provide for her. She doesn't belong to him. I paid him five pounds for her, Doolittle. Either you are an honest man or a rogue. Doolittle tolerantly. A little of both, Henry, like the rest of us. A little of both. Again, uh, it is a it is another example of reparty and reparty is um, uh, reparty is uh, as I as earlier told you is a quick witty reply. So we see that uh, this technique um, uh, Shaw has put in the mouth of 
uh, this man Doolittle, who is uh, uh, who is a great source of humor and fun in the play. Uh, Higgins, well, you took that money for the girl, and you have no right to take her as well. Mrs. Higgins, Henry, don't be absurd. If you really want to know where Eliza is, she's upstairs. So here, uh, Miss, Mrs. Higgins has exposed uh, what she has been hiding that Eliza is upstairs. Higgins amazed. Upstairs? Then I shall jolly soon fetch her downstairs. He makes resolutely for the door. Mrs. Higgins, rising and following him. Be quiet, Henry. Sit down. Higgins, I, Mrs. Higgins, sit down, dear, and listen to me. Higgins, oh, very well, very well, very well. He throws himself ungraciously on the ottoman with his face towards the windows. But I think you might have told me this half an hour ago, Higgins. Okay, uh, we see that uh, he's, oh, very well, very well, very well. He actually behaves like a child, what Mrs. Higgins uh, uh, often calls him. Mrs. Higgins. Uh, Eliza came to me this morning. She passed the night partly walking about in a rage, partly trying to throw herself into the river and being afraid to, and partly in the cold. Hotel. She told me of the brutal way you two treated her. You two, um, Higgins and uh, Pickering. Higgins, bounding up again. What? Pickering, rising also. My dear Mrs. Higgins, she has been telling you stories. We didn't treat her brutally. We hardly said a word to her. And we parted on particularly good terms. Then he turns towards Higgins and he says, Higgins, did you bully her after I went to bed? Higgins, just the other way about, she threw my slippers in my face. She behaved in the most outrageous way. Most outrageous way means most disgraceful manner. I never gave her the slightest provocation. The slippers came violently banged into my face the moment I entered the room before I had uttered a word and used perfectly awful language. Pickering, astonished. But why? What did we do to her, Mrs. Higgins? I think I know pretty well what you did. The girl is naturally rather affectionate. I think, isn't she Mr. Doolittle? Mr. Doolittle, because he is the father. So Mrs. Higgins assumed that probably he knows better about her. Doolittle, very tender-hearted ma'am, takes after me. And it is quite humorous as well. Takes after me? Uh, he, uh, that he is uh, uh, making a comment that the daughter is just like him, Mrs. Higgins. Just so, she had become attached to you both. She worked very hard for you, Henry. I don't think you quite realize what anything in the nature of brain work means to a girl like that. Well, it seems that when the great day of trial came and she did this wonderful thing for you without making a single mistake, you two sat there and never said a word to her but talk together of how glad you were that it was all over and how you had been bored with the whole thing. And then you were surprised because she threw, uh, she threw your slippers at you. I should have thrown the fire irons at you, Higgins. We said nothing except that we were tired and wanted to go to bed. Did we pick? Pickering, shrugging his shoulders. That was all, Mrs. Higgins, ironically. Quite sure? Pickering. Absolutely. Really, that was all, Mrs. Higgins. You didn't thank her or pet her or admire her or tell her how splendid she'd been. Higgins impatiently, but she knew all about that. We didn't make speeches to her, if that's what you mean. Now, Pickering, conscience-stricken. Conscience-stricken uh, means uh, that he feels sort of uh, guilty. Then he says, Perhaps we were a little inconsiderate. Is she very angry? So we see that Pickering is the very uh, Pickering is the first one to realize that probably they have been wrong somewhere, which Higgins obviously does not realize till the very end. Mrs. Higgins returning to her place at the writing table. Well, I am afraid she won't go back to Wimple Street, especially now that Mr. Doolittle is able to keep up the position you have thrust on her. But she says she is quite willing to meet you on friendly terms and to let bygones be bygones. 
Higgins furious. Is she? By George. Ho, oh, Mrs. Higgins. If you promise to behave yourself, Henry, I'll ask her to come down. If not, go home, for you have taken up quite enough of my time. So we see that a mother is quite clear how to treat uh, the childlike uh, son of her, Higgins. Oh, all right. Very well. Pick, you behave yourself. And this is interesting and uh, humorous as well that he says to Pickering, who, who is always quite um, uh, uh, well-mannered. So he says to her, uh, sorry, he says to him, Pick, you behave yourself. Let us put on our best Sunday manners for this creature that we picked out of the mud. He flings himself sulkily uh, into the Elizabethan chair. Sulkily uh, means with extreme dis uh, displeasure. So Elizabethan chair, again, is a reference to, uh, uh, to the sort of furniture that is placed at uh, Mrs. Uh, Higgins' home. Do little. Uh, demonstrating, uh, demonstrating like uh, to present reason in opposition. Now, now, Henry Higgins, have some consideration for my feelings as a middle class man. Mrs. Higgins, remember your promise, Henry. She presses the bell button on the writing table. Mr. Doolittle, Will you be so good as to step out on the balcony for a moment? I don't want Eliza to have the shock of your news until she has made it up with these two gentlemen. Would you mind, do little? As you wish, lady. Anything to help Henry to keep keep her off my hands. He does, disappears through the window. So, uh, we see that what a father he is when he says that anything to help Henry to keep her off my hands. That he does not want to um, um, have Eliza back to him. Okay. The parlor maid answers the bell. Pickering sits down in Doolittle's place. Mrs. Higgins. Ask Miss Doolittle to come down, please. The parlor maid. Yes, ma'am. And then she goes out. Mrs. Higgins. Now, Henry. Be good. I am, Higgins says, I am behaving myself perfectly. Uh, Pickering, he is doing his best, Mrs. Higgins. So we see that he, um, Pickering is a person who has a very good understanding of probably uh, of almost everyone. So being friend, he understands Higgins, uh, what he actually says and what he actually means. Then a pause. Higgins throws back his head, stretches uh, out his legs and begins to whistle. Mrs. Higgins. Henry, dearest, you don't look at all nice in that attitude, Higgins, pulling himself together. I was not trying to look nice, mother. So we see that Higgins is what he is. He does not He does not pretend to be otherwise, Mrs. Higgins. It doesn't matter, dear. I only wanted to make you speak, Higgins. Why, Mrs. Higgins? Because you can't speak and whistle at the same time. And uh, this comment is important because we see that um, uh, well, there is very subtle humor and very refined humor that we find in Shaw's play, place. Higgins groans another very tiring pose. Um, Higgins springing up out of patience. What the devil is that girl? Where the devil is that girl? Means again, he appears to be impatient so we see that right from act one to right uh, act five he is the same person and though he is the major character one of the major characters in the play but he appears at the same time to be a very flat character okay he says where the devil is that girl are we to wait here all day eliza enters sunny self-possessed and giving a staggeringly convincing exhibition of ease of manner. She carries a little work basket and is very much at home. Pickering is too much taken aback to rise. So um, Eliza's this entrance is um, significant in, in a sense that uh, it gives a very uh, it gives a glimpse into a very different sort of a person it is uh, what we call metamorphosis of uh, character she has completely transformed and this transformation is reflected through her body language Le um, eliza 
How do you do, Professor Higgins? Are you quite well? Higgins, shocking. Am I? He can say no more. Liza, but of course you are. You are never ill. So glad to see you again, kind of bickering. He rises hastily and they shake hands. Quite chilly this morning, isn't it? She sits down on his left. He sits beside her. So we see that um, uh, Eliza is behaving the way Higgins um, has been teaching her. Uh, the same uh, parrot-like talk that we found in um, Act 3. Higgins, don't you dare try this game on me. I taught it to you and it doesn't take me. Get up and come, come home and don't be a fool. Eliza takes a piece of needlework from her basket and begins to stitch uh, stitch at it without taking the least notice of his outburst. Um, here, um, uh, stitching, the, the motif of uh, st stitching is important uh, because uh, stitching means to uh, bring things in new pattern, to, uh, to bring things into new order and sequence. And we see that um, probably this... Uh, motif is completely aligned with the personality of um, this character Eliza because she is also the one who is weaving her new personality. She is in a process of changing herself. Mrs. Higgins, very nicely put indeed, Henry. No woman could resist such an invitation. So here we see that um, uh, Mrs. Higgins be is being ironic and she is also uh, represent, uh, representing the voice of reason and uh, rationality. Uh, in the play. Higgins, you let her alone. Uh, alone, mother. Let her speak for herself. You will jolly soon see whether she has an idea that I haven't put into her head or a word that I haven't put into her mouth. I tell you, I have created this thing out of the squashed cabbage leaves of Covent Garden and now she pretends to play the fine lady with me. I have created this thing. Okay, so here uh, from now onward, when um, uh, Eliza is, uh, uh, is present on the stage and Higgins is on the, on the stage, we see that uh, 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 Higgins appears more to be uh, more like uh, the Pygmalion of the title than as a professor of uh, uh, phonetics. So that godlike god -like feeling which Higgins uh, assumes in Act 1 um, and uh, which Shaw bestow, uh, bestows him with is more prominent in this act. Mrs. Higgins, placidly, yes, dear, but you'll sit down, won't you? Higgins sits down again, savagely. Eliza, to Pickering, taking no apparent notice of Higgins and working away deftly. Will you drop me altogether now that the experiment is over, Colonel Pickering? Pickering, oh, don't, you mustn't think of it as an experiment. It shocks me somehow, Eliza. Oh, I'm only a squashed cabbage leaf. Pickering impulsively. No, Eliza continuing quietly. But I owe so much to you that I should be very unhappy if you for forgot me, Pickering. Oh, it's very kind of you to say so, Mr. Little. Eliza. It's not because you paid for my dresses. I know you are generous to everybody with money. But it was from you that I learned really nice manners. And that is what makes one a lady. One a lady, isn't it? You see, it was so very difficult for me. With the example of Professor Higgins always before me. I was brought up to be just like him. Unable to control myself and using bad language on the slightest provocation. And I should never have known that ladies and gentlemen didn't behave like that if you hadn't been there. And uh, this is also important, this uh, speech and uh, speech onward, that uh, Eliza is doing sort of a self-analysis. And she is comparing um, herself with Higgins. And uh, if we see that uh, um, uh, the, uh, Higgins is the same person throughout the play. But this is uh, the... Galitia of uh, Pygmalion by G.B. Shaw that is a round character who is dynamic as well. Eliza has many sides to her, uh, to her personality and she's the one who has capacity to develop and who has capacity to change herself, which Higgins lack. Higgins, 
Well, Pickering, oh, that's only his way, you know, he doesn't mean it. Eliza, oh, I didn't mean it either. When I was a flower girl, it was only my way. But you see, I did it. And, there, and that's what makes the difference after all. Pickering, no doubt still, he taught you to speak and I couldn't have done that, you know. So Pickering is the one who is always on uh, uh, the defensive side for uh, Higgins, Eliza, trivially. Of course, that is his profession. Higgins, damnation. Eliza, continuing. It was just like learning to dance in the fashionable way. There was nothing more than that in it. But do you know what began my real education? Pickering, what? Eliza, stopping her work for a moment. You're calling me Miss Doolittle. That day, when I first came to Wimpole Street, that was the beginning of self-respect for me. Self-respect means that this is the new Eliza speaking here. She resumes her stitching. And there were a hundred little things you never noticed because they came naturally to you. Things about standing up and taking off your hat and opening doors. Thinking, oh, that was nothing. L Liza, yes, things that showed you thought and felt about me as if I were something better than a scullery maid. Scullery maid is a kitchen maid. Though, of course, I know you would have been just the same to a scullery maid if she had been let in the drawing room. You never took off your boots in the drawing in the dining room when I was there. Pickering, you mustn't mind that Higgins takes off his boots all over the place. Liza. I know, I am not blaming him. It is his way, isn't it? But it made such a difference to me that you didn't do, do it. You see, really and truly, apart from my things, anyone can pick up the dressing in the proper way of speaking and so on. The difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves, but how she is treated. And this is what actually matters. And this is what uh, Shaw actually driving us at the difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves but how she is treated i shall always be a flower girl to professor higgins but because he always treats me as a flower girl and always will but i know i can be a lady to you because you always treat me as a lady and always will mrs higgins please don't grind your teeth henry so again uh, mrs higgins comments show that Henry Higgins is actually getting angry at what Eliza is saying and is still unable to express what he really wants to see and what he's actually feeling at the moment. Pickering, well, this is really very nice of you, Miss Doolittle. Eliza, I should like you to call me Eliza now, if you would. Pickering, thank you, Eliza. Of course, Eliza. And I should like Professor Higgins to call me Miss Doolittle. Higgins, I'll see you damned first. Mrs. Higgins, Henry, Henry, picking, uh, pickering, laughing. Why don't you slang back at him? Don't stand it. It would do him a lot of good. Eliza, I can't, I could have done it once, but now I can go back to it. Last night when I was wandering about, a girl spoke to me and I tried to get back into the old way with her. But it was no use. You told me, you know, that when a child is brought to a foreign country, it picks up the language in a few weeks and forgets its own. Well, I am a child in your country. I have forgotten my own language and can speak nothing but yours. That's a real break off with the corner of Taunton Court Road. Living Wimpole Street finishes it. Pickering, much alarmed. Oh, but you are coming back to Wimpole Street, aren't you? You'll forgive Higgins. Higgins, rising. Forgive? Will she? By George. Let her go. Let her find out how she can get on without us. She will relapse into the gutter in three weeks without me at her elbow. Relapse means that she will fall back to her older ways and she will um, degenerate there. Um, okay, we take up a uh, pause here. We stop here and uh, we'll continue uh, Act 5 uh, from this point in the next lecture. So, see you in the next lecture.